The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, folks, or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the post-election postal service uh, situation, a summary. Uh, we're going to be starting in about two minutes. Uh, we, I can see folks still coming on to the coming into the parking lot here. So once we get everybody inside and seated, we can start the program in about two minutes. Talk to you soon. Okay, good afternoon again, folks, or good morning, again, depending where you happen to be. Welcome to today's webinar on uh, the Postal Service after the election, our post-election post -election Postal Service Summary. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about several things, uh, uh, but some, give us some logistics first. Today's webinar is being recorded, uh, and all of your lines are going to be muted during the presentation, so you can use the the question box uh, in the lower on the side of your screen to uh, submit questions. And we'll answer those uh, either during or at the end of the presentation, depending upon uh, when they would fit best. Uh, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you shortly after the webinar is ended. Uh, as you can see, there is a handout. The handout is the slides uh, from today's presentation. So don't sit there and try to write frantically before the slide changes. Uh, today's discussion topics, <clears throat> excuse me, will will be uh, the major events in the postal industry in the in the run up to the election, uh, including the postmaster general's initiatives and how they affected the the postal service and the election, uh, what to expect from the postal service before the end of this year, and how the changes that are going on that happened that are continuing and so forth will impact mailers, ratepayers, and mailing service providers. Uh, next year and beyond. And there are a number of things to discuss in that arena. Uh, presenting today, uh, I'm, I'm Leo Raymond uh, from Mailers Hub, and joining me is the Angela Anagnostopoulos, who is the Vice President of Postal Affairs, or for, for, for Postal Affairs from Gray Hair Software. Uh, Angelo is a, a, a senior veteran of the postal arena and is uh, more, than, more than qualified <laughs> to, to offer expert comments today. You can read a little bit about us on, the, on this slide in your handout. So moving into the actual issues we want to talk about today, we've got some, as you know, there were a lot of partisan concerns over the, the board nominees and the selection of the Postmaster General. Uh, there were operational challenges that were <laughs> very nonpartisan, such as staffing shortages caused by the pandemic and transportation uh, losses because people or aircraft weren't flying as much. And then there were initiatives the PMT started, uh, some of which he was actually continuing, uh, whether they were regarding overtime, uh, extra late, extra or late trips, uh, equipment uh, removal or mailbox removal. So there are a lot of things that were going on in the background here, which which compounded the the partisan conversation, or there wasn't a, <laughs> conversation is too polite a word, uh, the partisan uh, back and forth that was uh, so characteristic of this whole of this whole election season. Angelo? 
Yeah, you know, I think, Leo, you're right about uh, the hypersensitivity that was out there around some of the initiatives that the Postal Service was doing that, you know, were basically started well before um, the Postmaster General even, uh, you know, took uh, his position. Uh, things like, you know, uh, decommissioning equipment, uh, taking out uh, blue collection boxes and all that. I mean, that's just something that's been happening for a long time. And I don't think the the general public fully understood, uh, you know, what was going on there. So well, let's uh, talk a little bit uh, about vote by mail and uh, some, of the, some of the things that, that happened there. You know, it was really kind of an unprecedented event. It was the largest turnout in history uh, as far as, uh, you know, people showing up to vote, which was really good. I mean, it's great in a democracy that people, you know, come out to vote. Uh, USPS, I, I have to say, did a really, really good job, you know, contrary to some of the things you might have heard from some of the partisan bickering back and forth in that. I think, you know, they managed it uh, probably better than any other election. There were some reports of, you know, employee uh, interference. Uh, there was a whistleblower that came out as an example that has since recanted. So, you know, you wonder, you know, really, you know, what that was all about, but um, there wasn't anything widespread that was reported. Uh, the other thing, you know, not following uh, the judge's orders on sweeping facilities and that. So, you know, it, the, some of the judges decided to get involved and try to tell the Postal Service what to do, even though they, you know, they really, if you think about it, don't have the authority to do that, but they did that and they were forcing them to do that and produce special reporting. And they're continuing to force them to go through facilities and make sure that they're sweeping facilities for any uh, ballots that are left behind. Uh, the one thing that I, you know, it's clear to me is that vote by mail is here to stay. I don't think it's going to be going anywhere. And I think it's going to be popular in the future just because, you know, the convenience of it. You know, I live in Arizona and I, I'm a uh, vote by mail. I signed up when I changed my driver's license to Arizona and, you know, it's pretty convenient. Uh, and it's, it's a very easy way to do that. One of the other things that a lot of people don't know are uh, ballots are still coming in. People are still mailing in ballots. There's still, you know, stuff floating through the network. And the Postal Service is doing what they can to deliver them. Uh, hopefully, some of these jurisdictions are marking them properly as, the, as they're being received. All right, next slide, please. That gets to the you know, election jurisdictions. There's just such a large number of jurisdictions. I mean, there's over 10,000 of them. And there are a lot of different rules in each jurisdiction on how they handle ballots, when they can count them, whether they can count them early or whether they have to count them on election day and all that. And that's really, you know, what causes, I think, more issues. And some of that was blamed on the Postal Service when it's really just kind of local rules that drive some of that uh, and, and what's going on there. Uh, it's real interesting, you know, you look at some of the largest jurisdictions and, you know, they have dedicated staff you know, some of the really, really small areas and some of the rural uh, places, they actually count ballots out of people's homes in that. And so, you know, you have a kind of a variety of different uh, jurisdictions, some that are very highly sophisticated and some that are not. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, we learned a lesson through this uh, last election and uh, there could be some better standardization across the country. Well, uh, Angela, you know, to that point, uh, early along, when there was a message that went out from the Postal Service about uh, mailing early, uh, th th there was a lot of concern that that indicated that they, th th they weren't ready to handle it, uh, ha handle the volume. But the fact is, is that many of the jurisdictions that you're referring to, the smaller ones, had to learn how to prepare a bulk mailing. That's essentially what it is. And the Postal Service, working with people at that local level, the non-professionals, uh, was something they probably hadn't expected to have to do to the degree that they did it uh, because uh, there was no way to foresee the the unprecedented interest in vote by mail that occurred this year but th this is a lot of a lot of really rushed learning going on uh, in among some of those uh, electoral election groups yeah that's a really that's a really good point leo i mean i know the 
the legal teams at the Postal Service took a look at the, the rules in all of the different jurisdictions. <clears throat> and as an example, you know, there was one jurisdiction that said that you could request a ballot the day before election day. I don't know how you would pull that off and be able to get it and be able to vote on election day. So, you know, just some of these rules have to really get standardized across the country. Um, next slide, please. And so we get to the elections. So this was pulled, um, I think, early Wednesday morning. And since then, I think they've called another uh, three electoral votes for uh, Trump. But as you could see, you know, based on where we're at, subject to any kind of litigation that overturns anything, which is highly unlikely, our next president will be Joe Biden, since he has a pretty commanding um, lead there. So that's that's where we stand from the president. As far as the House, the House has clinched with 218 uh, votes. And let's go on to the next slide and take a look at the Senate. And so the Senate uh, yesterday, uh, they called uh, Alaska uh, on the Republican side. So we're down to two undecided seats. In Georgia, there'll be a runoff on the 5th and that will determine what's going to happen in the Senate. Uh, the reason why this is important is um, if um, it stands as it is and the two seats in Georgia go to the Democrats, then it'll be 50-50, and then the vice president will cast the deciding vote. So uh, the end result of that would be, you know, you would have Democratic control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency. If uh, one or two of the seats in Georgia end up in Republican hands, then you'll end up still with a Republican majority in the Senate, and that would add some checks and balances uh, throughout the system. So you could bet that there's going to be a lot of money that's going to get poured in between now and January 5th before uh, the runoff elections happen in Georgia. Of course, the interesting thing is, is that the uh, you tend to have uh, a greater polarization uh, in the in the Senate and the House uh, than it has than there has been in, in previous years, five, ten, twenty years ago, uh, because there is there's less part of the part of the term gentlemanly conversation uh, among the members and more uh, more firing from behind their social media bulwarks. Uh, so you're going to have people on the far right and the far left, whether it's the House or the Senate, uh, less inclined to compromise on things uh, than they would have been in the past. One of the people who survived the election uh, was uh, Susan Collins from Maine. And though she is a Republican, she is probably she is probably one of the last of the surviving members of what they would call, the, I think it was a gang of six or the gang of eight, who were more senior senators from both sides of the aisle who could get together and, and discuss issues and, as centrists and reach compromise. And I think that that type of uh, more, more level-headed discourse is probably even more threatened now than it was in the previous Congress because there is less interest in compromise and each constituency's uh, wings or fridge, fringes tend to threaten people who want to seek compromise uh, and view them as traitors of some sort to the partisan doctrine. So um, even though we're going to have a strongly Democratic House, or le less strongly, but still Democratic House, and probably a pretty evenly split Senate, it's not going to be easy for anything, I don't think, when we're talking postal legislation here, for anything to get through, given the fact you're going to have this tug of war, uh, not only between the parties, but within the parties over how to approach each component issue. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, let's let's go on to the next slide. And so the the new administration, and here's here's some of the effects, uh, you know, that Leo was starting to allude to. So Biden um, has the ability to add uh, three governors, and the ability to replace an additional four during his term. So you could see it as, you know, the board of governors could become much more. Uh, labor friendly and much more liberal in composition. And so that's what's going on there. 
In the PRC, uh, four out of the five commissioners uh, during his term are going to be eligible for replacement. Now, I think the first of which I don't think is going to happen until like 2022. But, uh, you know, that could also change the balance of power within the PRC as well and, and make it, again, more, more liberal-leaning. Um, so we'll have to see what happens there. Uh, there's going to be a new Treasury Secretary, which will definitely have a different view than the current Treasury Secretary and could, as an example, uh, change some of the rules around the borrowing authority for the Postal Service and make it... Uh, a little bit uh, easier for them to get and you know, without as many restrictions, et cetera. So we'll have to see really what happens. Bottom line is the impacts of these changes are gonna be unknown um, you know, as we go forward, but we'll have to see what happens and what the effects are of any administration uh, changes that are going to be coming within the next uh, you know, couple of years or so. Leo, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, you know, on the next slide here, we can see sort of a capsule of the, of the many things, including the things that uh, uh, Angela just mentioned. Uh, the governors and the PRC and the secretary of the treasury and all the, those top cabinet level posts all have to be confirmed by the Senate. Uh, so given the fact that you've got this partisanship we talked about, uh, that's going to be, that's going to be a factor for consideration. Supposedly, uh, Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell are friends who worked together back when Biden was in the Senate. So whether that, that helps any or not, uh, it's going to be a, a, very, a very heavily tainted process, partisan tainted par process, uh, regardless of whether you're confirming a nominee or whether you're considering something like prefunding or postal reform. Uh, the, the, the one thing that probably is hopeful, uh, last almost two years ago now, a year and a half ago, there was a bill filed in the House to simply end the prefunding obligation. Uh, it was passed by the House, but of course, like many other things, it died in the Senate. Whether it has a chance of being resurrected and passed by both houses uh, in 2021 would be an interesting situation to consider. Postal reform probably still is uh, too complicated, too much of a Christmas tree of favorite topics, favorite uh, issues to really have uh, a strong chance, unless there's a lot of compromise, more than we saw before. At least this time, we don't have a hostile administration attitude toward the Postal Service. You don't have anybody calling it a joke. You don't have anybody saying they have to raise their package prices four, fourfold uh, because Amazon is getting a deal of some sort. Uh, so that's that's a good thing. Uh, you also are going to have to see what happens with all this pre-election legislation, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, lit litigation rather. Uh, you know, I don't think, as, An as Angelo said, I don't think this is going to really do an awful lot to change the course of history, but it's going to have, it's going to have a continuing impact on the mindset of the Postal Service uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, managing something as sensitive as an election, as election mail. Uh, it, it, this time they were they were far from transparent in not only their uh, their their COVID concerns, their COVID struggles, uh, but in a lot of other things. And this left the, the the media field open for people who weren't particularly qualified to comment about the postal service to say what they thought. And and then the media, who often wasn't that that deep in ex experience or background of the postal service sometimes took what they were told and ran with it without really uh, being accurate in their reporting about what the Postal Service did or why it did it or something else. So that's another thing to, that's gonna be an ongoing concern. Uh, of course, the, the new administration is gonna be happier, uh, more, I shouldn't say happier, it's gonna be more oriented towards union interests. Uh, and, and that was, is always gonna be a factor in how uh, legislation concerning the Postal Service is considered. Uh, the wild card remains uh, the PRC's action on its 10-year review, which it fit, which it ended or started, I should say, almost four years ago. Uh, as you may know, uh, the issue comes down to whether the uh, rate-setting process enables the Postal Service to achieve a variety of objectives, uh, one of the most important being uh, financial stability. 
and the, the 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 lack of stability in that area is obvious but it's not caused by a flaw of the rate setting process it's caused because uh, of the outsized burden of the pre-funding mandate unfortunately the prc cannot say that they are only left with fixing uh what they've got to what they have available to them to fix the rate setting process so they've got uh they've got a challenge there in in ending uh, their review in entering their rate their uh, their rulemaking rather yeah, without somehow causing a rate increase that is beyond the ability of of beyond the tolerance of rate payers to uh, to deal with so let's see we're going on from there somebody asked me so there was a question here do you see any major changes uh, in the in the postal administration well going on to the next slide you got you know the probably the best question will the PMG stay yeah, um, so that, yeah. <laughs> go ahead you, you know i guess if you survive this far it's, you know who knows uh angelo what do you figure yeah so my in my opinion is i think that he will stick around he seems to be dedicated and very interested in uh you know trying to turn the postal service finances around and to look look for new lines of business um you know i was reading an article this morning about uh a cooperative effort with the FBI that the Postal Service has to do fingerprinting services and stuff. And, you know, because they have such a large footprint, I think, uh, you know, those kinds of things are really good for the Postal Service to take on and to be able to do to, you know, find additional revenue channels, uh, you know, outside of the traditional mailing type stuff that they can do. I, I think he'll stick around. I think he wants to see this through. Uh, you know, we'll, again, we'll have to see what happens um, uh, with that. You know, as far as the, I guess, the rest of the organization, we are hearing that, uh, you know, there's going to be other uh, organizational changes that it's not, it wasn't a one and done. I think they're letting the dust settle a little bit, trying to get through peak period, and, you know, before any more changes are made. But, you know, I fully expect that, we, you know, we'll see some other things. Uh, were there any other questions, Leo? Before we, uh, we we just somebody was uh, commented that uh, the, on, on the the use of the, or the presence of the vice president and, and that person's uh, influence in a vote in the Senate and the, and the comment was actually until a replacement is in place for the vice president elect Harris, it will be one less Democrat in the Senate. So yes, her job will have to be filled by a special election from California. Yep, no, that's a good. That's a really good point. Yeah. So there's a lot to consider, obviously, um, you know, the, 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 but the point that I've been trying to make over time is that if there was something that had to be done on its, the, the merits of which were clear in, I don't know, January 2020, then probably the merits of that are still there in November 2020. Uh, the, the, you made the comment earlier, Angelo, about mailboxes uh, for, for years, uh, the Postal Service had been studying usage of blue boxes and if they have not been utilized enough to make it worth having a carrier stop once or twice or whatever a day to to pick up mail then they would pull the box uh and during the election season because it was so hyper partisan people were accusing the postal service of doing that to deprive people of of an of access to to the system you, you know you know there's no way to mail my ballot well i think anybody who uses a a uh clothespin to put outgoing mail to their mailbox will find the carrier will pick it up so not having a blue box on the corner does not deprive anybody of the acts of access to to uh to the mail system if you have a, if you're in a rural community and you you don't have a box because there's no delivery then you're going to go to the post office anyways if you're going to be on a rural route with a with a curbside box or you know you can put the flag up and put the mail in it so there's a lot of things that I think in the, in hopefully returning sanity after the election uh, that, that will be resumed, things that were worthwhile doing before that are going to be worthwhile doing now because all of them, many of them I should say, uh, have to be done to try to get some handle on costs. And postal service right now, the postal service right now has serious cost problems and whatever it can do to help those problems or to ameliorate them, I think is something which ratepayers and the commercial mailing community uh, should probably support. Good points. So um, 
continuing on, uh, the next uh, item is around reinstatement. Um, oh, previous slide, please. Uh, reinstatement of cost cutting and efficiency efforts. So, you know, it's a little bit sticky given some of the court rulings that were preventing the Postal Service from reinstating any of the efficiency and cost cutting measures that they were putting in place. And you can see the, the little graph on the right from the OIG report, you know, in the, in the month of July, um, late trips and that were cut dramatically. And, you know, if you were to be able to continue to look at that graph, it was starting to get better, you know, as far as service until, you know, they were requested to stop because of uh, the election and making sure that, um, you know, things were uh, moving as quickly as possible throughout the network. As far as the changes going back into effect, uh, you know, my personal thought is I don't think we're going to see anything until at least next year. We're in peak season right now, and so the Postal Service is humming along, uh, trying to make sure that we get, you know, through through this season and things get delivered on time. The one thing that the Postal Service did get a lot of criticism on is they did, really didn't do a service impact analysis on the effects of putting in these types of changes. So, you know, if I were to give some free advice there, I would say that, you know, the USPS should do that prior to reinstating any of these cost-cutting measures again, just to give everybody um, a, a warm feeling that, you know, we're not going to start to see major declines in service performance like we did, you know, throughout the whole month of July. You know, well, the next I, time, go ahead. No, no, it's interesting you say that because uh, a question I've always had in the back of my mind is, is why did no one at headquarters in a senior leadership role uh, advise or, or advise the new PMG about you know slow down here we we have we have to check make sure it's not going to cause problems or if they did why didn't he listen uh, because you know for example the uh, the issue about um, overtime obviously the, the overtime was out of control but did did no one say well before we have to make sure that the, the facilities are adequately staffed during pandemic Ill, during pandemic absenteeism, uh, you know, was there no caution given to him, or did he just not listen? Because you're right, there should have been some sort of uh, evaluation of what's going to happen if, you know, Initiative X is in, implemented right now, and, and there wasn't. Uh, so that that's 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 a concern that I've always kind of had the back of my mind of how is how this you know, how this get loose without anybody checking first. Yeah, good points. So the, the next item is around coronavirus relief. Um, seeing that COVID cases are rising dramatically across the country, I don't know that that's going to give the House and Senate any kind of incentive to try to get this thing through before the end of the year or before the end of the current term. So we will have to see, I mean, you know, never say never, but it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens uh, and if we could see any any coronavirus relief uh, between now and the end of the year or even in the, you know, the first year of January. And then the, the last item, which uh, Leo started to talk about in the previous slide around uh, reform legislation. I mean, if you look at the last number of years, it's basically the the old Chaffetz bill that's been kind of just retweaked a little bit here and there, and you know has been passed through the House but couldn't get through the Senate. The, you know the Senate had uh, you know different idea of what will happen, you know what should happen with this type of legislation. I, I am hearing you know kind of through the rumor mill that they're looking at scrapping any of the old language and just you know taking a clean sheet approach to coming up with brand new uh, legislation that might be a little bit more amenable between the House and Senate and something that they can get passed through, uh, dealing with things like, uh, you know, the um, retiree health benefits and some of these other things that uh, you really need to be addressed. Uh, next slide, please. And so some, you know, other things to consider, you know, within that uh, forgiveness of the, re, you know, as I said, uh, the health benefit obligations, 
Um, USO legislation, I mean, that's that's been out there for a while. Uh, yeah, I know one of the PRC commissioners is very passionate about this, especially since, you know, when she was involved uh, in Congress that uh, she dealt a lot with uh, rural uh, constituencies. And so, you know, USO is important and it really needs some legislation, especially when you know, you see the amount of money that the Postal Service has to spend on that and things like Alaska Bypass and some of these other things in order to maintain that. I think it needs it needs some better definition. Uh, the next item is the President's Task Force Report. Um, you can pretty much um, consider that filed in the garbage basket um, since now there's going to be a new administration coming in. I would fully expect that um, the new president will create a new task force maybe to take a look at the postal service from a different uh from a different lens so we'll have we'll have to see what uh, happens there the uh 2021 uh price change uh, you know everybody's aware of that i don't know leo if you had any thoughts on that no uh the the price change like like all price changes had things that were good for some people and not for others uh, but that's sort of normal. Um, we, as we, we went over the, the, the review of the uh, price change a few weeks ago in another webinar. But as always, you can look at, at, a, um, at a rate seller rate category and see a change that was uh, large or small, uh, which looked good or bad, but looking back over two or three rate cases, price changes, you can see that the the, the net over that period of time probably was a wash in many situations particularly if you were not in a in a mandated uh, circumstance where, such as when the PRC says you have to raise uh, the price, the rates for flats higher than the CPI because they're so far uh, below cost coverage, or you have to raise the rates for uh, periodicals as much as you can because they're below cost coverage. You have to lower the pass-throughs for discounts to 100% to or less. Absent those those that were really done at, at the behest of the commission, uh, over time, I think the price change price changes have been relatively uh, consistent in line, consistent with the CPI change, and hasn't created a whole list of big winners or big losers. Somebody will have an advantage over here or there, so or a disadvantage over here or there, but I don't think there's been anything really uh, hurtful to an industry or a sub industry as a whole. Uh, the, the one thing that, that I would kind of go back to, to add to on your comments, Angelo, was the task force. Uh, the one thing that they, that they said probably uh, more explicitly than a lot of other task forces had in the past was the need to review the universal service obligation. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, the question becomes the same. Have the Postal Service, you know, be what you want it to be. Is it a business or is it a service? And if it is a business, you have to empower it accordingly. If it's a service, you have to find a way to pay for it. Because right now, I think uh, all of us as persons probably spend five or six dollars a year on postage, ten dollars, twenty dollars, and send out a lot of Christmas cards. But none of us spends enough money on on postage or services to to support the post office that's in our neighborhood or the cost of bringing mail to our doorsteps or our, or our mailboxes. So this leaves commercial ratepayers to be the ones footing the bill for services the public wants. And whether you're, as I said, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, at some point you have to uh, realize that the chickens are gonna come home to roost. The Postal Service can't, can't keep providing everything that everybody wants to everybody uh, who wants it without having a way to pay for it. And, and I do hope that there is a level-headed discussion uh, about the USO in order to have some resolution to this fundamental question of how do you do what people want you to do when there's no money coming in to pay for it. Okay, end of, end of, end of brief tirade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the last item on this slide is, uh, is around the 10-year review. And, uh, you know, Leo, you talked a little bit about it. I, I, I did hear some rumors that the PRC is going to try to put something out by the end of the month. So we'll have to see what happens. If you know it ends up being a final rule, 
it'll be interesting to see, you know, the, how that gets implemented. Because at this point, I think it's just way too close to the January price change to try to kind of bake it into that as well. So we'll have to see. You know, another example of you know the the price change was on the parcel side where you know, they have a temporary price increase. So in essence, they have three price changes, you know, within the period of like, you know, a couple of months. And so it's it's very disruptive to industry when, um, you know, these price changes happen. And, you know, the more you have, the the more work, you know, that has to take place in order to do that, especially a lot of people are locked down, have locked down their IT infrastructures between now and the end of the year because of peak. So we'll have to see, but that's something to keep an eye on to see, you know, what the PRC comes out with. And, uh, you know, if it comes out between now and the end of the month, we'll have to see what happens. But, you know, I would expect that, you know, at some point in the very near future, they're going to put something out because this, this thing's been going on for way too long. So I'll turn it over to Leo for the last slide. Yeah, uh, a lot of this, of course, we've already touched on briefly. Some of the pre-election stuff is not going to go away. Uh, the pandemic is not going to go away, unfortunately. It's going to be around for months probably to come. Uh, and that's going to affect not only staffing, but uh, the transportation that was usually in place to move first-class mail and priority mail <laughs> that now is not available. So whether service performance is going to continue to slide as it, as it did over the fourth quarter, uh, or not is still to be seen. I don't think you're going to have uh, the, the, anything, any different type of variance across the country than you've seen before. You're still going to have some places that do a good job, even though the situation is not perfect. And some places where service is going to be bad, no matter what. Uh, we did a report in our last newsletter that showed how that variability affected uh, areas and districts and categories of mail. And this next issue of the newsletter will have the, the quarter four uh, service numbers. So service has, has suffered for a variety of reasons. And I don't think it's going to have the, it's, it's not going to be rebounding right away because the planes aren't going to be flying anymore and people aren't going to be healthy all of a sudden. So that, that impact is going to have, have, uh, it's going to be continuing. Uh, finances, uh, it's going to be a strange situation because even though there's declining volume of letters and flats, uh, some would say significantly declining, uh, a significant permanent decline, uh, the, the, the boom of package volume uh, has actually brought Postal Service finances, uh, in, at, least in, at least in the last month or two, up to uh, being in the black. Now, whether that makes the whole year in the black, we won't know until probably tomorrow when those numbers are released. But it's, 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 a, it's a, a benefit, but it's also a concern because I don't think postal competitors are just standing there, you know, blithely letting the postal service get, get new package business. They're going to want to take that. So whether the post service can retain, can retain that, that the package business it got uh, is yet to be seen. Beyond that, we haven't seen the competitive prices for 2021 yet. The governors have not uh, issued that, so we don't know what's going to happen. Whether there's a, in some of, in their mind, whether they're wondering what to do, given the fact they have temporary increases in place now, I don't know. But you've got international uh, pricing in 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 a in flux uh, because of how self-declared rates are, are being rolled out amongst major international mailing countries, uh, and you've got domestically. The continuing issue of network right sizing, uh, and this this is something which is not just a matter of mailboxes and machines, but it's it's facilities. Uh, there's a point at which you cannot keep expanding the distance between uh, facilities because the, the the geography, time and space don't change. Put it that way, but there are still too many facilities, uh, there are still too many machines, and there are still too many people, unfortunately, for the amount of mail that's in the system. Uh, and because you can't you can't flex your workforce as much as uh, in the postal service as much as you'd like to or could in the private sector, you can't simply take unnecessary clerks and make them carriers, for example. Uh, you know, that's going to be a, an ongoing problem. That, that's that's going to have a political component because if you're going to try to close the the last I don't know what the number is now 30 or 40 facilities that were supposed to have been closed or consolidated five years ago, if you're going to try to resume that because there's no longer uh, an operational need for them, 
you're going to run into union resistance and that's going to ha immediately have a political consequence, which could mean keeping the facilities you don't need again. And that's a cost and that's a problem for people who have to pay that cost, namely commercial ratepayers. So, you know, these are things that are gonna, they're not going to go away because of a change of postal, change of, uh, change of the presidency or because of the PMG changing, if you know, because it was a problem for, uh, it's a problem now for Louis DeJoy, it was a problem for Megan Brennan, it was a problem for Jack Potter, you know, so this is not something which is new, it's not something that's going to go away, uh, but it's something that has to be tackled at some point if you're going to have a manageable, efficient, and economically viable postal system. End of, end of second speech. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there's a lot there, Leo, so if, you know, you look at just I'll give you a couple of examples. So you look at the task force report, essential versus non-essential mail. It almost forces the postal service to have two different networks, which you know doesn't really make any sense. You know, you look at um, the, the the PRC proposal, which allows the postal service to raise prices depending upon how much volume is in the system. You know, that could have very negative consequences. And then, as you you know, you were talking about earlier around service performance. You know, some there's you know some people in the industry that say you know I want the cheapest possible prices, and deliver it when you can. And others that say you know give me predictable service, and I might be willing to pay a little bit more. And you know some of these some of these things just you know have to be talked about, have to be figured out. And as you were saying, you know where USO fits in all of this, and does it, you know, get subsidized through taxpayer dollars or, you know, does it get continue to get subsidized through ratepayer dollars? So a lot of this stuff, you know, we'll, we'll have to figure out as, um, as we move along. But there's a lot of big questions that I think need to be answered. Well, um, there was a conversation that I think you were in the other day about, about you know, the future of the Postal Service. And uh, the, the, along the lines you were just mentioning, and you know what came to my mind was was uh, the Royal Mail. Uh, of course, that was obviously the, the United Kingdom's postal service, and for years it was a government function until it was broken up and turned into semi-privatized. Uh, there is still a public service uh, element, I guess, left, uh, but a lot of it was outsourced. Now, if you think about it, there's there is there is no chance that the postal service could be privatized. In the, in the in the sense that you would just take it and sell it to a company or to an investment group, but there 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 is no reason why pieces of it could not be uh, contracted out more than uh, what you see contracted out now. So, is is it possible for have uh, to have a postal system that is a hybrid? Sure, you you could retain a service component that is supported by by tax dollars or by you know, by the rate payers, and then have a uh, more business-like component that is competitive beyond just the competitive products that you see now. So, so you're never going to come up with with one creature that that meets both needs. It's just not not logical. But what you what you do to evolve beyond that circumstance is something that but regardless of the logistics or the economics would be a highly political issue, highly political process. And I'm not, I have no confidence in politicians to find the best answer because I don't think they can, they can do that without feeling threatened by their respective constituencies. You know, I think, you know, saying that um, if you look at the postal service unions, they did all endorse uh, Joe Biden. So I think, you know, there's some some payback there. And so from, you know, if you look at it from that lens, I think, you know, we're going to be maybe in a better position than we have been in, in prior years um, to be able to get some legislation or something or, you know, some changes through. So, you know, I'm, I've always been an optimist, so we'll have to see what, what happens there. And, and I don't think it's, you know, I, I could live with either one, but I just would wish somebody would decide which one, it's because right now it's it's just, you, it's constantly fighting with yourself in a way, because they try to be efficient, and they hurt service, and then you try to provide service, and you end up with greater costs, which it's just, it's a, it's a, 
it's, you keep going in a circle chasing your own tail. So in, in a way, I guess I'll, if I could ask something of the incoming president and Congress is please make a decision. Please decide what this agency's role is. Is it a service or is it a business? And then please follow through with legislation that, that fully embraces the decision that you make. Yeah. So do we have any questions left, Leo? I don't see any more here. Uh, let's see, let me check one more time. No, the, the two that we got earlier, the last two. Okay. So uh, did you have any, uh, any that you wanted to, to throw out? Michelle, did you have any you gotten earlier? Here's one. Any thoughts on the USPS Biden transition team led, led lead of Ron Stroman? Ah, <laughs> funny how that works out. Uh, as you know, Ron Stroman re resigned. I guess he retired, but he left the Postal Service uh, in, was it 1st of June or 1st of July? It was in midsummer, uh, probably in, in part in a reaction to how the politics of the Postal Service were developing. Having chosen Ron as the lead for a transition, team, part of the transition team, uh, I think as a signal that, that Biden wants someone who understands the issues and has worked on the ground with Congress about reform and finances and other things. So uh, you know, although he's obviously somebody who is in partisan alignment, he's not so partisan as to be, you know, biased in, in a way that a radical would be. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that, that um, he would help guide the Biden administration to offering some intelligent solutions to some of the Postal Service's chronic problems. And Oh, here's another question. Look at this. With the decreasing work share discount between SCF and NDC, do you think we will start to see movement of the mail volume back to the NDCs? Well, Angelo, uh, what, do you, yeah. what do you figure? Yes, that's <laughs> probably. A, that's, a, that's a really good question because... Yeah. Um, if you if you look at it, and I I don't have the statistics in front of me, but th there were some studies done around the effect of that, and so you're definitely going to see some mail leaving the SCF and getting entered at the NDC. This is kind of the problem that I was talking about before, where you have some customers that need certain service performance because maybe they're targeting in home dates. They're just going to suck it up and pay the additional dollars. Others that are a little bit more cost conscious are going to go ahead and dump it there. We know when we look at service performance reporting that the farther away you get from the SCF, the worse the service is, uh, with worse being end to end. But uh, what you're more likely to see because of where the NDC rates are, you're likely to see some stuff go all the way from SCF all the way to origin entry, um, you know, because people will just won't want to bother and so there, there will definitely be an effect there it, it, it'll be real interesting to see what happens because the postal service does have some access capacity within their network and so you know they'll be able to absorb some of that but you know i do expect to see some impacts in service as a result of that which are just going to make the scores a lot worse uh, but you know we'll, we'll have to see we'll have to wait and see you know whether people uh, prioritize delivery versus uh, economics around mailing. And, and as in every rate case, when people ask, you know, what's what are the consequences of this? It's very much a situation of of where the the individual sits. Uh, you know, look at run your run your typical mailing if you're a mailing service company or, or or a mailer, and see how your economics are affected by this change, and see how your service performance is probably affected. And then, as you were saying, Angelo, make the decision. Can you can you bear the additional co additional cost? Is your particular mailing profile one that uh, enables you to go to the SCF a lot? If, you know, is it worth it, or is your mailing profile so so uh, uh, scattered, if you will, that you, that you go into the NDC and just makes sense? It's very matter very much a matter of how the individual mailing would suggest. But over the years, the postal service has gone back and forth. Uh, you know, between encouraging SCF or encouraging NDC, partly because of how it wanted to influence mailer behavior, but also because of how the the discount itself 
uh, was was uh, in line or wasn't in line with cost avoided. So there's a lot going on behind the numbers uh, that causes the Postal Service to change uh, these relative discount, the differential between discounts, besides just their desire to to have you drop stuff at an NDC or not. Yeah, so, you know, if, if let's say you're targeting in home dates and you want like a one to three day window, you have to drop it at the SCF. If, you know, you you don't care if you want a three to a, like a 12 day window, go ahead and drop it at the NDC, you know. Right. You, you, have, you have to see, you know, what, what are your goals? Right, and, and now with, you know, generally decreased volume, uh, you're going to see some customers, some, I mean, rate payers, and some mailing service providers having less density to support going deeper into the system. So that means whether you like it or not, you're probably going to have to consider uh, dropping in an NDC. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, let's see. I don't see any in the queue right now. I think we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, so um, barring any further questions, I think it's time to wrap up. Let everybody go home. Uh, we want to thank everyone for calling today, getting on the call. We hope you found it informative. Uh, again, the recording will be distributed to you after the webinar, and the handout is available for you to download at your at your leisure. Uh, if you have any questions, you can know, please contact Angelo or myself at the uh, email addresses you see on the screen. And uh, we hope to have you join us again next month for our uh, another webinar, a, a end of the year wrap up, which is going to be, I'm looking quickly for the date, on the 17th of December, if I'm not mistaken. And that would be at one o'clock Eastern. So again, thank you uh, for calling in today. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Jennifer, for being in the background, helping out. Thank you, Angelo, for being uh, an outstanding asset in this in this program. And uh, thanks to all of you again for calling in. We hope to hear from you or see, from, see you uh, again on, on our next webinar. Thanks again. Stay safe. Bye. Yep. Thanks, Leo.